Mina Lele is the author of The Baby and the Biome. As a food allergy and asthma parent, she is committed to bringing an end to the immune diseases that plague 80 million Americans. Mina has designed, run, and published multiple large clinical studies across orthopedics, vascular medicine, and allergy. She has an engineering and a business degree from the University of Pennsylvania and is the founder of Little Nixon's, an allergy prevention company. We're so excited to have this chat. Uh, thank you for joining. I would love to uh, allow you to expand on that if you'd like to um, in your introduction. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that's way more of an introduction than I would normally give myself. I usually just say I'm, I'm mean all you probably don't have any reason, good reason to listen to me. Uh, no, but yeah, no, I think the, the key there is just that, um, um, you know, allergy is like my life now as my, it's, uh, uh, you know, something I never thought that my family would have to deal with. And then as my son has, uh, has had to deal with it his whole life and it, and it really takes over your life because it's food allergy in particular, because you eat three times a day. Um, but also even some of the other allergic diseases, uh, just, they're just the chronic, right? And the nature of chronic disease is that it's just always with you. So it's my life now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So your own personal experience is what kind of sparked your interest in the topic of the microbiome and food allergies. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it was really that, that whole question, like, I don't understand how this happened. And, um, doctors forever, just for lack of better, answer for parents and assuming that nobody would call them on it, I think, said, you know, it's it's genetic, it's in your family. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like my husband and I have no overlapping recessive genetic traits and it's not on neither of our families. Right. And also I like a lot of people, like you say a word like genetic and they're just like, I don't know, science, you know? And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense, you know? And I needed a real explanation of what happened. And, and again, the core of that is if you don't know what the problem is, you can never solve it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's like, that's like rule number one of engineering, right. Is you have to properly define the problem. <laughs> and that's how mm-hmm. I got into this whole discussion of the microbiome. That's incredible. So what is the baby's microbiome? Yeah. So the microbiome, um, now, honestly, people, when they say that term, they mean different things, but it means the stuff that's living on us and in us. But truly, it's always on us, right? So the microbiome lives on your skin. It lives in your lungs and your airways. It lives in your gut. And as I like to remind people, all three of those things are actually outside your body, right? Your yeah. gut is actually outside your body. It's a, it's a, hol- it's a tube. Um, and it's, so the microbiome for the most part, doesn't live inside your cells, you know, that kind of thing. And most people, when they talk about the microbiome, they're talking about bacteria. Some people yeah. are also including the funguses and viruses, but sometimes we call that the fungome or the virome. Yeah. Um, but that's it. Definitely. So what is the reasons that some kids develop allergies, but not others, um, in your experience and kind of like your research? Yeah. So I have an experience of one, an N of one, right? So I can't yeah. speak to my <laughs> experience per se in that sense, right? I don't know specifically what happened to my kid necessarily, but what they understand about the microbiome is it's two, it's two things that are very interrelated. So on the one hand, your microbiome actually makes up the barriers of your, you know, again, your skin, your lungs, your gut. And when we develop these immune diseases, a lot of times what's happening is that you have proteins or pollens or other things that are ending up inside your body that should be on the outside of your body, right? And why is that? Well, it could, we can literally get what they call barrier dysfunction, or, or you could think about it like holes, or people have called this concept leaky gut, because mm-hmm. the wrong bacteria in any of these places can actually either punch holes in it or just make it weak or other things. So that's one part of the answer. The second part of the answer is that in a very complex way, your microbiome inter interacts with your immune system. So an allergy or any immune disease is a mistake your immune system's making. So we have to ask that question, why did the immune system make this mistake? And the immune system could be reacting to the wrong bacteria, or yeah. it could just be upset. Like sometimes a lot of this is just because your immune system is in a heightened state, and they call it like an inflammatory state. And then you know, it's, it's a, I liken it to like, you know, when you're, when you're, 
rage driving and you sort of like make more mistakes, right? Like whenever you're angry yeah. <laughs> or you're rushed, you start making more mistakes. And it's kind of like that. If your immune system is rushed, it's going to make mistakes. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. So um, when we're looking at allergies and these different things that our body is experiencing that are leaving our body in that like heightened state, what are the consequences of those allergies in the body? Oh my gosh. It's, this is where it gets really nasty. Um, because from an acute perspective, when you have these immune mistakes happening, right? Like you eat, my son eats a walnut and his throat will close up. He'll have horrendous gut pain, you know, acutely for days afterwards, right? So that's one level of like what can happen, but it doesn't just stop there, right? So our immune systems are, your immune system is, is, is so um, entwined in every, every other system of your body, right? So we know that these sorts of pro-inflammatory things cause endocrine issues. They cause, you know, again, type 1 diabetes, celiac, ADHD, and autism are actually um, immune diseases are being more often defined as immune disease, right? They're starting to call even uh, Alzheimer's, like a type 3 diabetes. And all this is all from this pro-inflammatory state. Right. So, I mean, the thing is, you could go on and on. It almost gets silly, like in that way that like anything could be, you know, a uh, cause of it. But it's not wrong because when yeah. your systems are upset, everything starts to go haywire. Yeah, definitely. So we know that like there's different factors that we can't necessarily like see with our eyes about an individual person or an individual, like necessarily people group or like family of like what mm -hmm. caused this allergy to exist within this family where those right. are still like pieces that we're still researching and discovering, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, um, making like strides in that direction. But are there things that a parent can do who's pregnant to reduce their baby's food risk allergy during their pregnancy? Um, and what would that look like? Yeah. So in pregnancy, again, and, and throughout the first thousand days of the kid's life, and then for the rest of their life, right? It's it's about reducing, it's about reducing the risk. So like think think about it this way. Like if you um uh you know, let's say, let's say you you had this house, which is like your body. And you couldn't see it, right? Everything's underneath a tarp. But we know that if we like send a bunch of rats underneath the tarp, we don't need to see exactly what happened. <laughs> right? Totally. To know that they're probably not going to be helpful, right? And, and um, so, so it's kind of like that. So there's kind of the way I like to think about it is that there's certain things that start to like increase a person's risk of the malfunction and things that decrease the risk of a malfunction. So when you're pregnant, what increases the risk is things that increase your inflammation. So having a very weak vaginal microbiome, right? So if you're having, if you're having repeated yeast infections um, and uh, um, uh, or UTIs and things like that, right? That's yeah. a sign that the vaginal microbiome is off, and that's the first microbiome your baby's going to get. Yeah, right. Is as it passes through the canal, so that's not great. Let's fix that. Um, actually, a lot of the chemical exposures you get are the same thing. Like those chemical exposures, our bodies can deal with them, but they have to go into an inflammatory state to deal with the chemicals, whether that's from your foods, again, so eating chemical laden foods, it could be bad diet, right? A low fiber, a low vegetable diet is going to feed back bad, unhelpful bacteria in your gut, which is then putting a, you know, a pro-inflammatory state for your, your baby. Um, it could be, you know, painting the walls. It could be, there's some things that it's harder to deal with, like air pollution we know is a huge cause yeah. of, of this sort of increasing inflammatory state and that one's harder to deal with. <laughs> yeah. There's some extent to the, you know, the layers of like, how much are you exposed to, right? Like there's mm -hmm. some things that like, yes, they're harmful in large doses, but in a small amount in pregnancy, like you shouldn't be fearful. Right. Um, are there some like day-to-day -day things that folks can do in their pregnancy to kind of like reduce their risk or increase like their vaginal microbiome, for example, to decrease these risks? Um, in yeah. like a pregnancy by pregnancy case. <laughs> 100%. I think nobody likes this answer because it's always the right answer. It's yeah. diet. It yeah. is like our the the um the amount to which we eat food that feed pathogenic bacteria 
lo and behold, those pathogenic bacteria are going to grow. And our gut bacteria are very deterministic of our skin microbiome and even our lung microbiome, right? So that's it. Like, honestly, so much of what's gone wrong is because we all eat terrible diets. Your diet should be almost entirely real food. It should be almost all vegetables and whole grains and, you know, lean meats and things like that. But you know, they say like shop in the, uh, you know, the periphery of the grocery store. It's like, it's really stuff that nobody likes to hear because it comes back to basics. Right. But, right. but again, like almost all health is like eat well, get sleep, get exercise. Yeah, totally. But that's the crux of everything. It's like the reason that's so, so pivotal to our health is in this case is because it drives, it promotes and feeds the helpful bacteria. And what you want is to feed those helpful bacteria. So they overwhelm all the bad stuff. Totally. I think this is comes back to some of the conversations that can be had about like our society and how, you know, processed foods and things that are just like really over processed to become cheap and accessible for families, especially low income families. Mm -hmm. Are there are there ways that families who are lower income that ways that they can access kind of some of these foods to increase, you know, their health and well being? Yeah, I mean, Dairy is great in the form of yogurt is better because it has lactobacillus bacteria in it. Um, but I think that there's this overemphasis, in my opinion, on fresh fruits and vegetables, mm-hmm. where you're far better off eating vegetables if you're willing to eat them frozen, even yeah. dehydrated in other formats, right? But as long as that's what you're eating, and I don't mean like, um, you know, like, what did I see the other day? Like, broccoli puffs you know which arguably have some broccoli dust in them or something right i don't mean that that's not a form i'm talking about like but canned you know but honestly if you stick to canned beans canned vegetables frozen yeah. you know frozen stuff like you would do so much better on that, that diet you know yeah. honestly like corn tortillas they're 100 percent corn like there's a lot of actually like cheap foods that you can get that are actually 100 percent really just that thing I love that. That's very, very helpful. Totally. So let's get uh, a little bit more into like preventing food allergies and going Mm -hmm. in that direction of the conversation. So I think a common myth is that avoiding foods prevents, uh, avoiding specific foods prevents food allergies in your children. And why is that actually a problem in preventing food allergies? Yeah, it's, um, well, the reason is because even when you think your kid isn't eating those foods, they are, they're getting exposure from their environment. And what the body is trying to do at that age is figure out what stuff is it supposed to be afraid of and what stuff is it not, right? And so the way the body learns, um, the infant's body and immune system learns what stuff to tolerate is the stuff that the parents give it. And so if you think about it, right, like you trace the baby will crawl around and like trace, touch, um, you know, ragweed, but doesn't eat the ragweed and, you know, um, or like weeds in the grass, but should be eating certain vegetables or proteins or whatever else, right? So the body starts to differentiate and say like, okay, the stuff that I'm being fed is the stuff that I'm going to tolerate. And I I like to think of this analogy, if you think about it, right? Like we we always ask this question, how do kids learn language? There's so many sounds a kid hears. How does a child's brain learn to figure out what sounds are the sounds that we should pay attention to and we should turn our chain, you know, like tune our ear to, to figure out language? And it's the things, the sounds that get repeated by mom and dad, right? And so it's really similar. It's the foods that your parents feed you in enough quantity and on a regular basis, that's what your body learns to tolerate. So starting before six months old and through their first birthday, the babies actually need regular exposure to all the foods that we expect them to eat as an adult. Yeah. In, in an infant safe form, to be clear. Yes. <laughs> um, and that is how the baby learns. This is the diet I'm going to be expected to eat when I'm older. Yeah. You know, or, or, or some people ask like, how come, how come, you know, a baby here or a child here, you know, like you get a red crushed red pepper flake in the kitchen and they freak out. But in other parts of the country, world, these kids can tolerate really hot food. It's because what's they're ta- taught to tolerate. Yeah. And it's also like exposure, like through utero as well. Like through, we talk about constantly, like the foods that parents are eating, like during pregnancy and stuff. Um, how does that affect, like, does your diet during pregnancy, you know, if you're eating foods that this child is going, if your, if your diet is kind of like wide and vast and carries a lot of the same similarities, like, does that get them started? Interestingly, no, 
So okay. interestingly, the data shows that what you eat from a specific, like eating of the cashews is not going to create cashew protectiveness. And in fact, for a lot of infants, it could be counterproductive. So, so, but, but um, eating a very healthy diet in pregnancy is what will, again, it will feed the correct bacteria, which will set your kid up for a healthy gut so that then when they start eating food, they won't develop allergies, right? But totally. from, like, does it matter if it's walnuts or cashews in pregnancy in terms of that? No. And the one caveat that I will say is um, m- when mothers, not so much in pregnancy, but when you're breastfeeding and before the baby's eating food, um, what mom eats, especially if she's eating like while nursing or whatever she's eating and then immediately touching the baby with, right? Because we all like kind of eat and then like, yeah, you know, <laughs> because the baby's crying and we're like, shove it in our mouths and quick, go pick up the baby. But that food that's on your hands goes onto your baby's skin, right? So especially not for every baby, you don't need to panic about this, but if your kid has eczema, if your kid has a broken skin barrier, you have to be very careful about what's on your hands before you touch that baby, because now you're actually putting the proteins into their bloodstream in a way that's going to cause sensitization to those foods. So, um, you know, so again, it's just like, it's just about washing your hands, rinsing your hands before you touch them. But um, yeah, it's it's not a one-to-one from mom to baby. It's really about what baby eats is what trains tolerance to the foods. Incredible. That's amazing. So what are some of the like l- latest developments in allergy research that you've been watching? Um, I know Katie put a note for us about um, to ask about the LEAP study. Um, what is that? What are some of those pieces that are very interesting to you at the moment? Well, so t- <laughs> just because I'm, I'm deep in this, right? LEAP study is like old hat at this point. This is like yeah. <laughs> eight years ago. Um, we proved or I didn't prove anything. Gideon, Gideon Lack and George Detroit and their teams proved that when babies eat these foods in infancy, they dramatically reduce the risk of those food allergy. And when I say dramatically, I mean dramatically. Like they're 97% preventable. Peanut allergies are 97% preventable. So that's like vaccine level preventable, right? Yeah. And all we have to do is make sure that they're eating those proteins regularly in their diet. More recently, what we're seeing in the last couple of years is actually a huge emphasis on the microbiome and how that's affecting food allergies. So in mice, and they're starting some human studies, they've actually, they were able to encapsulate the microbiomes of mice that didn't have allergies, and then put that into the mice who did have allergies and reverse their allergies by doing that. And so, you know, again, not in human yet, but basically the idea is that by shifting someone's microbiome, you can actually, um, and I'm not sure, is it about sealing their gut or is it about these bacteria themselves will kind of digest the proteins differently or what? But in any case, it seems like you could almost transplant a non-allergic microbiome and that might be a really interesting field of uh, treatment in the future. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting. Or even pieces of all of it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about early introduction. Um, I know you mentioned like introducing things early. Um, How early is too early and what does that look like? So um, too early is really mostly about when the baby's physically ready for food, right? So we typically want to start always before six months old but they say not before four months old. And again, it just depends on the kid, right? There's some kids that are like monstrous at five months old and like, you know, like could probably take you out and maybe those kids are great to eat at four months. I don't know, you know, and there's other ones that are not. So, but, but, you know, early introduction means that instead of waiting till age two or three or whatever, and again, because, because cashews and things are not safe for babies, right? So what is early introduction is getting that cashew protein, that peanut protein that hard boiled egg protein, things like that into the baby's diet in an infant safe form from six months old and doing it regularly. And I can't emphasize that enough because there are just so many people who think early introduction means you feed it once, right? And it's because it's a stupid name. You only get introduced to something one time, but it's about the regular continuous exposure to the food that that's what trains the tolerance to it, right? Um, and so that's that's really what that's a tolerance training is all it is, and um, you know by six months in infancy yeah, form. Totally. Are there any risks, I guess, to early introduction um, if you're using you know age safe forms? I mean, we're not talking about you know giving a kid an actual like nut that they could choke on, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, interestingly, there's no risk to it. There's, yeah, it's actually the safest time to do it. And so parents are worried about what if my kid has this reaction, right? 
And the thing you should know is that the younger the baby is, the weaker their immune system is in some sense, right? Um, which is why kids with RSV or babies with RSV do so much worse than an older child, right? Right. Um, and so in general, that's not a great thing. But in this particular case, it works to your advantage because if a baby actually has an allergy already when you start feeding them this food, and again, they don't develop the allergies. They're not born with them. They develop the allergy. So right. almost always, if you're starting early enough, you cut off the development before it can happen. But it's, you know, again, nothing's 100%. So you're still going to get a couple kids who start at six months, and at six months, they have an allergic reaction. But that allergic reaction is almost always just vomiting. Yeah. Maybe they get hives, but they don't, their throat closing, all that stuff doesn't happen actually until age three and higher. And because right. you think about how strong your immune system is to like choke you. Yeah. Right? And so <laughs> the, the, yeah. the babies, thankfully in that way, uh, their immune systems aren't strong enough. You're going to see those like reactions in a softer way um, and then be able to monitor yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. how have, are you seeing the conversations with like pediatricians shifting? I know um, with my daughter, they like walked me through at like four months or like, all right, you can start introducing allergens, which I had never heard a pediatrician talk about. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I'm like curious to know if that was like an abnormal kind of like unique no, no, no. experience this or is... if that's becoming like the shift, if that's, if that's shifting um, as well. Yes. Since 2017, that has been the guideline of the American Pediatric Association. Every baby should be being told to introduce these foods early, or peanut yeah. specifically, yeah. has been the guideline since 2017. And in 2021, the two allergy associations made guidelines with a strong recommendation around early introduction of peanut, and early introduction of well-cooked egg, again, hard-boiled egg, and do not delay all the other foods. So every parent should be being told this. And this is actually the, if you wanna know the story about little mixins, this is the crux of the issue, right? Because the whole deal here is that, actually, so this is a true story. In 2018, I believe, to get recertified as a pediatrician, you had to read the LEAP study and prove that you understood it, right? Nice. <laughs> but 70% of pediatricians still aren't talking to parents. Okay. And you ask them why, they say, well, they specifically won't talk to parents on Medicaid and they won't talk to parents if they think the parent isn't going to do it. Interesting. And so this is an access issue because not every parent has access to infant safe forms of these foods. And not right. every parent has the time to prepare these foods in an infant safe way two times a week. Right. It's, it's, it's a real burden. Right. Yeah. So um, the, the entire intention of little Nixon's is to take that question out of it. Right. Because I say this to doctors all the time, like how insane would it be if we were like, well, we know that folic acid is great for your baby and your pregnancy. So here's a list of foods that have folic acid. Good luck to you. Yeah. Right. Like that would be insane. Bad idea. So, <laughs> bad idea. Cause nobody would get it. And so instead we give people folic acid. Right. And so kind of the long ongoing, the whole point of little mixins is really so that if you take the work and the thinking out, and you can do it in a cost-effective way, then it becomes accessible to a much wider group of patients, right? When I started this whole journey, you know, I found out about early introduction, of course, too late for my older son. The data hadn't come out yet. And all my friends were like, dude, like, there's no way. I don't have time, right? Everyone I know, all, all my friends, like, work full-time, you know, whatever. And one friend who was like, I did it. It was great. And I was like, that's amazing. Like, you travel. Like, how did you, how did you get this stuff in? She's like, oh, my nanny did it. Okay. And I was like, okay, yeah. okay, great, but not a scalable solution. <laughs> right. <laughs> For the majority of Americans, that's not the case. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. so tell me a little bit more about Lil Mixins and um, your story of starting that and how pe how folks are using it. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the story was really with my younger son then. We really wanted to make sure he got all these foods in his diet regularly and it was actually really, really hard. And, you know, again, I, I have a chemical engineering degree. I have a dangerous amount of information about food science. So, and I was traveling a lot and my husband works full time too, right? So I actually tried to prepare all these foods in a way that were infant safe and kind of shelf stable and stuff so that we could make sure he was eating them regularly. And it was like, it was a bonkers amount of work. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then, you know, we were having this conversation one day and actually what happened is I was at drinks one night with some of my girlfriends in the neighborhood. And I was like, this is so crazy. Like it's such a horrible disease. And just because we just like refuse to make it easy for people. 
you know? And so like all these kids, hundreds of thousands of kids a year are going to grow up with a lifelong deadly condition because we just said like, good luck to you. Yeah. And, and, you know, my friend, I was just like whining. And so my friends were like, well, why don't you do something about it? And so, so I did. That's amazing. I love it. So tell me a little bit more about the products and how folks are using them, how parents are using them and how it makes their life easier. Yeah, so really, you know, again, not like, not rocket science here, um, but it's, it's, uh, you take the proteins and all we do is we make them into infant safe forms, meaning that they won't clump. They're not, you know, they're not a choking hazard. They're pre-measured so that you know that you're giving your baby the adequate amount, which is two grams of protein in a serving. And, you know, we have just, they're not like hyper processed or anything or artificial. It's, it's a hundred percent real food. So honestly, like peanut butter is you grind peanuts and to make yeah. our product, all we do is grind peanuts as well. You know, for example, um, with, with like milk or eggs or things like that, it's really like a sp- spray drying processes and things like that. But all it is, is like we were either dehydrating or defatting yeah. the nut or, or the food. And what that does is again, it makes it, turns it into a powder or, um, that can't choke baby. And so it gives you exactly the amount and the parents just mix it into whatever food the kid's eating. So if the kid's eating homemade food or if the kid's eating, you know, uh, store-bought food or, you know, I really discourage parents from putting it into formula bottles or, or breast milk bottles because we don't want to shift the protein content of, you know, totally. their, their hundred percent source of their nutrition. Um, but you know, you, you can basically mix it into anything. Yeah. It? Maybe like mashed sweet potatoes or something like that. <laughs> Just whatever Yogurt. they're eating. Even, <laughs> even the people that do like baby led weaning, like they'll, they'll like roll, yeah. you know, a piece of avocado in it and then the baby just can ingest it that way. Yeah. That's incredible. So as you're kind of like working in this, I would say kind of like a future of like what, what the goal is for baby feeding in the future is for folks to have access to little mixins. What other future therapies um, do you feel like are on the horizon that you're looking at um, for immune diseases? So one of the ones that we released actually earlier this year is after doing a ton of research and we actually, I actually had a paper published in the American Journal of Clinical Dermatology last month. Um, about this is we did all this research and found that there was really great um, data, 10-year data, multiple randomized controlled trials that showed that we could actually prevent about half of eczema from happening. And so what that requires, though, is that parents take this specific probiotic, it's l rhamnosis and you take it third trimester through the first six months of breastfeeding. So, and that's really targeted, again, more people who have a family history of atopic disease. Um, And and, and so, yeah, so if you, if you, cause if you prevent eczema, you actually slash the number of people because eczema is actually a cause of food allergy and then it can right. become a cause of asthma. So kind of what we're trying to do is prevent the sort of, um, you know, snowball effect of these diseases as early as possible. And so that's, you know, that's, that product line is something we released earlier this year and that's been doing well. And, and, and it's great to be able to help people, you know, kind of more holistically, but we'll keep searching for, anything that has really, really strong clinical data. Yeah, definitely. I think um, using that instead of uh, leaning in the directions of pseudoscience and like having things that are very clinically proven um, that parents can come to and trust that like, this is, this is going to be useful. It's actually going to help me Yeah, potentially. I love that. The sad thing about that is you do have to wait for all the clinical studies to be done, right? Right. (laughs) As impatient as I am, sometimes you wish those things would get done faster, but I don't feel great about asking people to spend money on something that doesn't have really good data behind it. Right. The scientific process is a little tedious on, at times. Yeah. As <laughs> or, I would say, all the time. You know, having done this is five year data takes five years, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's and then takes it, once it. it's been proven, it takes time for clinicians to put that into practice and it can, yeah, it can take yeah. a while for things to come. So it's cool to be kind of like on the forefront of like watching what's happening and keeping your eye out so that as soon as something becomes clinically proven, you can help families access it. So if you had a friend or a family member that was expecting they were planning to become a new parent or in the process of becoming a new parent, <laughs> um, what are Don't the- Don't let me near them unless they want to have their ear chopped <laughs> off. I love it. What are the top three tips that you would share with them though? Um, honestly, the, the three tips I say are, you know, um, really think about your diet and think about it in this way, right? Because I think it's, it's very arbitrary when people are like, don't eat shellfish, like don't eat ham. Like, you, you know, you're just like, well, I don't understand like why these random sets of things are not okay. Right. But it, when, when someone has a rationale for it and like, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? 
it makes it a lot easier. So it's, it's a really worry about your diet. The other big thing I tell people in pregnancy is to um, try and avoid group B strep, strep, which is a big, you know, which is about, again, your vaginal microbiome. If you have group B strep anyway, and your baby's going to have antibiotics, then as soon as they're out of that pregnancy, make sure you're using a probiotic, to, you know, with bifidobacteria to support that kid's microbiome. So number one, good diet from the beginning. Number two, you want a bifidobacteria and alaramnosis in these kids. ASAP. Those are the setup of a healthy gut. And then number three is when they start eating food, get all these foods in their diet. <laughs> yeah. And those totally. are those are the three clear ways to like again, it, it is really crazy like how effective they are actually. Yeah, it's like that old adage that an ounce of prevent um, prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So yeah. it's it's so true on so many different levels. <laughs> yeah, because if you think you don't want to spend time preparing the baby foods for your infant, let me explain to you how much time I spend preparing every single meal for the rest of my kid's life because nothing yeah. is safe, right? Right. <laughs> you yeah. Put in the time in those six months, and you'll be very thankful to. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing about all of this. This is extremely helpful. And I know it will be very insightful for the parents in our community and folks who find us um, on the Better Birth Podcast. Where can people find you um, to learn more about you, your books, your work, and um, Little Mixins? Yeah, so uh, the website for kind of that has all of this is Little Mixins. It's L-I-L-M-I-X-I-N-S.com. And the book, The Baby and the Biome, um, you know, have to do the, for YouTube, the obligatory Shot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that can be found um, anywhere that books are sold. So would love if you read it. It gives you a really you'll be, you know, uh, the most knowledgeable uh, pregnant person there. <laughs> I love group. that. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to like speak with you. Is there anything else that you would like to add as we like wrap up today's episode? No, no, I think I think um I think this has been great. I really appreciate your time and um, having me on. It's always cool. I think better birth is where it all begins. So um, yeah. it's the right place to be focused. For sure. Thank you so much.